Martin Luther King Jr. in answering fellow clergymen who considered him to be an outsider coming in, evoked in letter from Birmingham jail, the melting pot fundamental. Dr. King said, we're caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. Anyone who lives inside the United States can never be considered an outsider anywhere within its bounds. He was just teaching them the meaning of the melting pot. Things had already melted. It was too late. And attempts to tear them apart were doomed to failure. He knew that this melting had already been consummated as far back as slavery by American musicians of all hues carrying fiddles. In addressing the Berlin Jazz Festival audience in 1964, Dr. King said, long before modern essayists and scholars wrote of racial identity as a problem for a multiracial world, musicians were returning to their roots to affirm that which was stirring within their souls. Well, what was in their souls was the affirmation of a, com of a commonality, the affirmation of a commonality expressed in our brilliant hybrid art. A singularity of culture manifested in our folk tales across time, like Burr Rabbit becomes Bugs Bunny. <laughs> All over the Western Hemisphere, combinations of Afro-Anglo native traditions formed a hybrid Americana. In the United States, we loved the hybrid, but we couldn't like it. Better still, we loved the present, but we just didn't like the package it came in. Musicians were not judging. They accepted what sounded good without reservation. They were responding to what and whom they liked, and they were competing with each other to sound better. The segregation always came after the art. Even the first minstrel shows in the 1840s, though rife with unflattering caricatures, showed a range of Negro characters and responses. After 10 years or so, the one-dimensional, extremely demeaning portrayal became the standard that endured until the mid-20th century. In 1923, Bessie Smith's Downhearted Blues sold 700,000 copies for Columbia Records. The company was in receivership at that time. By the end of the year, her recordings had earned more than $750,000. Now, that's some old dollars, too. <laughs> and it pulled the company out of debt. Then. Southern distributors complained about her recordings being released on the main music series. So Columbia created a segregated series for blacks called the Race Catalog. The echoes of which we have, which have been heard in the music industry ever since. Somewhere in the late 1940s, a hybrid of jazz, country, blues, and hillbilly music emerges. It's called rock and roll. Early pioneers were Americans, Fats Domino, Elvis Presley, Chuck Berry, Little Richard, Buddy Holly, amongst others. But within 10 years of its definition as a genre, rock and roll became white, and R&B was black. By the 1970s, when I was playing in funk bands, the music charts were still color-coded. Segregation and the peculiar effects of Jim Crow didn't end there. The first rap music of the late 1970s was positive, uplifting even in some cases. By the late 1980s, the most progressive rap was being commandeered by the profane, vulgar, racist, and misogynistic stereotypes of blacks that had been cultivated since minstrelsy. And videos added a particularly devastating component. In the early 1960s, the British rockers tried to tell us, but we only heard the message for a minute. The blues is the melting pot of America. It is the melting pot of American styles. It's the miracle part, the master key, the all-purpose tool sold on late-night TV. The blues is the encounter with the other that transforms you and them. And blues came from life in a place where the people at the top had to contend with the people in the middle, had to contend with the bottom. Sometimes the top had to contend with the bottom. America where you were constantly pressured to address the other on human terms, and you were forced to be inventive and conversational and prepared to compromise, where competition drove you to be better, and it could come from anywhere, and it did. And strong counterstatement was always on the wind. It forced you to listen and speak with a clearer voice. That's why the blues is so true. 
Why, it's, it's casual, like folks talking around the dinner table or in the barber shop, where you know people listen as hard as they talk, or in bed, where they lie. <laughs> you see, I couldn't help it. The blues came up from the bowels of this country. It had to be accurate to survive. And in the shadow of a racism that had many a code name, like inner city and urban, the blues just kept coming up. Mark O'Connor told me that when he was a teenager, blues legend Bo Diddley asked him to hold his fiddle, and, and, and Mr. Diddley became teary-eyed. He told Mark that the violin was his first love, and that blacks were discouraged from playing fiddle on records so that the recordings could be segregated. Whites played fiddles, blacks played guitars. <laughs> anyway, both of them were playing blues. I grew up in a completely segregated South in the flowering of black nationalism. And right here tonight, Mark O'Connor and I have spent a lifetime playing blues on bandstands all over the world because it's in the American DNA. Whether you're from Seattle or New Orleans, whether you know it or not, you just can't outrun it. Thank <laughs> you.